Have a great day. Hello, folks. Uh, Dr. Matt Moynihan here. This lecture is going to be on plasma jet magneto inertial fusion PG, uh, PJMIF technology, which is its own chapter and its own family of approaches in my book, An Insider's View, uh, which I recommend that you get. PGMIF uh, is a unique technology, uh, so it gets its own chapter, and it's kind of a hybrid tech between ICF, so the laser fusion approach that was discussed in a previous lecture, and MCF, magnetic confinement, that you see in tokamaks and accelerators. So it's a mix between the two, and because of that, it's so sort of unique that it gets its own classification in my uh, menagerie of fusion approaches. So like a lot of these technologies, uh, it can trace its lineage to the work of one specific person who was a champion or advocate uh, for a technology. And in this case, the fellow's name is Dr. Francis Theo. And Dr. Theo uh, first publishes papers on M this approach in the mid to late 1980s. So uh, back a couple of decades. At the time, he was a researcher at the Westinghouse Corporation in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he was working on magnetic launch systems for aircraft, which what eventually became the EMOL system that they used to launch jets off of aircraft carriers in the, in the ocean, uh, if you're familiar with that Navy technology. Uh, back in the 80s, though, it was just a research project that Westinghouse was conducting for the Defense Department at the George Westinghouse Research Center in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And Theo was working on that technology there. At the same time, he was studying fusion energy and he was studying the ICF compression system. ICF, if you're following along with the other lectures, is where you take laser beams and you fire them at the surface of frozen fusion targets. Uh, the lasers explode outward and Newton's first law, there's an equal and opposite compression wave inward that compresses the material down to a temperature and pressure where fusion occurs. A typical ICF implosion might get to 10 million degrees Kelvin. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because it's about 10 orders of magnitude lower than a typical tokamak. A tokamak runs about 100 million degrees. ICF is 10 million degrees. So you can see a huge gap in performance there. Of course, ICF is much, much denser than a tokamak. So it kind of 10 orders of magnitude difference in temperature, but the ICF implosion is about 10 orders of magnitude denser in implosion. So if you're doing the triple product, uh, those two things kind of even each other out. So Theo was, was studying that system, and one of the problems that he saw that his approach will ultimately overcome is this uh, issue with a light, a light density fluid pushing on a solid dense target. Uh, and that's essentially what happens in ICF. The shock wave pushes a low density plasma against a really super dense uh, core that's forming as the shock wave compresses the target. And that, it, that causes an instability. That's a light fluid pushing on a dense fluid. It creates a problem called the Rayleigh-Taylor instability and another instability called RMI, uh, which in the name escapes me. But the Rayleigh-Taylor instability is essentially, you can think of it like a balloon being pushed on by pencils. Um, balloon water, uh, as it, the balloon pops, the water squirts out through the sides. The surface is unstable. It ripples. It rips apart. All of that taken together means that you have a crummy, uh, compression and you have a poor performance when you try to compress and that means that the it, it kind of suffers it, it hurts the reactor concept so it's a problem in icf and francis theo wants to propose a solution to that idea uh, so one way around this is to have uh, more closely matched densities have the driver and the target have a density that are more similar to one another. That means that you will avoid this, this Rayleigh-Taylor instability issue coming up. Uh, and so his proposal is to use plasma jets. Um, a plasma jet is essentially a plasma cannon that makes a plume of um, particles, uh, ions and electrons, and pushes it forward as a big blob into the center. Um, this is also good because it reduces the number of steps in the compression process. Um, in ICF, you got laser light becoming plasma, and then that plasma creating shock waves, which compresses other plasma. And 
you know, and in science, every time you have an extra step in a process, you have more ways of screwing it up and you have more opportunities to drive inefficiencies in your process. So this plasma jet system is a plasma jet pushing on a plasma target uh, in the center of a compression chamber. So that's essentially what he proposed in the 1980s. Um, it, it went uh, pretty much nowhere for about 15 years. Uh, and Theo moved on. He, he worked for a company and then he was hired by the Department of Energy as a program manager. And he worked there for about seven years uh, as a program manager for DOE, which is a pretty prominent position in the United States. And from that perch, he could push alternative ideas for fusion and, and fund sort of experimental stuff. Uh, and he was part of the effort that funded, ultimately, the first PGMIF experiment at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, and then ultimately, he, he left the DOE and became the CEO of a company called Hyperjet, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And then he was poached by China. Yeah, uh, he was brought over to the China um, two years ago, so 2019 now. Uh, and now he's, a, he's an American scholar trained in nuclear fusion, trained in plasma physics, working for the Chinese. It's an example of China essentially poaching U.S. talent. Uh, and I think it's something that doesn't get enough uh, attention in the U.S. Uh, scientific community. Um, but the federal government needs to pay attention. Um, he, Francis Theo was a quality scientist who was essentially poached. So as I said earlier, um, the idea didn't really go anywhere for about 15 years until the early 2000s when it was picked up by a Los Alamos researcher named Scott Sue. Now, today Scott Sue is uh, widely known because he's a program manager at ARPA-E and he's become a national figure in the fusion research development community because uh, he can fund alternative concepts and, and is a champion for a variety of, of innovative fusion concepts for, for the United States through ARPA-E and his roles there. But at the time, he was uh, just starting out as a staff scientist at Los Alamos. He had just come off a postdoc under Sam Cohen at Princeton University. And he was looking for a fusion project that he could sink his teeth to and make, a, make his mark. And he stumbles across Francis Theo's work on PGMIF and says, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we develop an experimental system around uh, this approach? Now, I said earlier, I was talking about the differences between ICF and, and Tokamax. And ICF is extremely uh, dense, but low temperature. And Tokamax are the reverse. They're extremely high temperature, but very low density. So PGMIF, uh, could be a way to study the middle ground halfway between both extreme conditions. And Scottsu latches onto this idea and um, includes in all his proposals, pitches, pitches and papers as a mid-ground technology. And that's part of the reason why he got it funded. Uh, he advocated uh, from that angle. And he may have spoken to Theo, who was probably at the Department of Energy at the time, who could advocate internally at OFES and DOE that this project should get funded. So um, those two things uh, are fortuitous, and that's part of the reason why PLX is, is with us today, because of that advocacy work and that positioning uh, within the scientific community. Uh, Scott Sue also built a lot of collaborations outside of Los Alamos to support him in this. Uh, he had a collaborator at the University of Alabama. He had others uh, probably at the University of Maryland. And he also had one private collaborator at a company called Hyperjet Technologies. So Hyperjet Technologies was founded in the 2000s uh, in Chantilly, Virginia by Dr. Uh, Doug Witherspoon. Uh, Dr. Doug Witherspoon founded the company around the idea of making the world's best and most efficient plasma cannons for a variety of applications, not just fusion, but other, other uh, applications. And uh, the plasma cannon that they end up building is, is really high quality. It has a 25% power efficiency. Uh, the circa 2017 technology. What I mean by that is for every unit of electrical energy that you put into the thing, you get about 25% of that out as plasma energy, which is probably more, it's way more efficient than laser systems. And it's way more efficient than any other plasma cannon that has existed before. Now, the way they got there was through a whole series of innovations around um, uh, understanding and modeling plasma behavior in plumes. So they built, uh, the, you can think of the system as uh, two concentric cathodes, an inner cathode, then a gap, 
and then an outer cathode that are in a circle. And the cathodes apply an electric field from the inner to the outer cathode, and that generates a magnetic field going uh, 90 degrees to it. So you have an E cross B force, a Lorenz force, that pushes whatever experiences that forward. So that E cross B force pushes the plasma out of the, the, the cannon and into the space in front of it. Um, a, uh, a hall thruster works very much the same way. Um, in the case of Doug's jets, they really work like shocks, shock waves of plasma that cuts off whole slabs of plasma that push forward. And that causes a really efficient generation of plasma. Um, and they had to optimize a lot of things to make that system work. They had to optimize the design of the inner cathode, the design of the outer cathode. They had to optimize where electrical energy was applied and to which electrodes. They had to optimize the field. They had to optimize how the plasma was actually injected. They created really fast um, switching systems that puffed out gases. All of this innovation was basically boiled into these cannons, and these cannons were ideal for the Los Alamos PGMIF experiment that Scott Sue was putting together. So the cannons go to, to, to Los Alamos, and Scott Sue starts experimenting with different configurations. They try one cannon alone. They try two. They try two facing each other. They try two on the side. Then they build an array of six. They try six on the side, um, and they study how uh, plumes that are ejected from these cannons would interact with one another. So do they collide head on? Do they collide on the side? Are there shock waves formed? Are there secondary shock waves formed? How do these things behave? Let's model it. Let's look at the theory. Let's get some data. Let's get some cool diagnostics to measure all this. Let's get some better diagnostics to measure more specific things. And then let's build upon all that work and write a paper that shows how this could turn into a power plant. Let's look at how we could, how many jets would we need? How big would they need to be? How can we inject a target first? All of this culminates in a 36 cannon PLX experiment uh, that is built uh, circa 2018, 2019 timeframe. Uh, by that point, Scott Sue had left Los Alamos uh, and he had left a protege uh, who he had hired from Georgia. Uh, and he was on to RPE at that time, and he was funding more innovative, interesting research from his perch at RPE. So he was a really good pick for the RPE position. Uh, there's not a lot of folks in um, Fusion that can build contrarian sort of careers that are outside the scope of, say, a tokamak or an ICF. Scott Sue was a rare example of someone who did that, and he was a successful scientist who built a lab around something that was non-traditional. You could call it non-traditional, but certainly has great value because, again, as I mentioned, PGMIF is a great way to study plasma in the middle ground between an ICF improsion and a tokamak uh, system. So um, all of this goes on. And at the same time, a fellow named Malcolm Hadley uh, joins the fusion community from the tech industry. And he enters our story about 2015, 2014. Uh, Malcolm, uh, was a employee at Google, and then he was the third or fourth employee at a company called Asana, which is now well known in the software world for making some of the best project management uh, and collaboration tools for software developers in the market. Um, Asana was founded, by the way, by Dustin Moskovitz, who is now a billionaire. Uh, he was one of the founders of Facebook, and he's in the Facebook movie, The Social Network, if you check it out. Um, so uh, Dustin Moskowitz uh, and, and Malcolm Hadley found the sauna. They grow it. They sell it. Uh, Malcolm makes you know his millions in that space. And now he's looking for a new project, and he sees Fusion as a potential uh, game-changing technology and wants to get involved. And he starts doing his research, and the first thing he comes across is the PGMIF technology that Francis Theo advocated for that's being developed at Los Alamos. And he wants to see if it's possible to take that tech and move it into the commercial space. I mean, what could we do if we put a little venture capital into this? Could we get something of value uh, or could we get something as great as a nuclear fusion reactor? So he starts traveling around and he goes to ICF uh, facilities like uh, uh, Losa, um, excuse me, National Ignition Facility and the LLE Omega system in Rochester. 
and he travels to Los Alamos and he travels to Hyperjet Technologies in Chantilly, Virginia. And he ends up uh, giving some money into Hyperjet and uh, becomes a board member and advises the company as they build out these 36 cannons and, and try to find other commercial applications for these plasma jets. Uh, and he founds a company called Strong Atomics, uh, which is the first venture capital firm dedicated specifically to fusion energy specifically. Uh, he hires a guy named Will Regan, who uh, was working at Google and had worked at RPE in the past and was a, a big enthusiastic person for fusion, who was advocating for fusion inside the Google um, Google universe. And so Will was moonlighting at, at Strong Atomics and working full time at uh, Google, and now he's working at um, uh, Google X or Moon at uh, the Moonshot um, a division of Alphabet. In any case, uh, this is where uh, PGIF sort of stands uh, right now in 2000. I don't have any other updates uh, from that point forward. Uh, Hyperjet Technologies uh, changed names and they became a company called Near Star Incorporated. And now uh, Doug Witherspoon is interested in applying the same technology to fusion rockets. Uh, where does PGIM stand right now? Well, actually, I'm not the best person to talk to about that. Uh, if I were uh, someone seeking more information on this, I would reach out to Scott Sue or uh, his protege at uh, Los Alamos. You could also discuss it with Glenn Worden, who is known. Uh, he's a senior scientist at Los Alamos and has a reputation inside the fusion community for being exceedingly rigorous. Uh, Glenn Worden is a guy who finds problems in almost every single approach to fusion that you can throw at him. He's exceedingly exacting, and I absolutely love the guy. He applies the most extreme rigor to any single theoretical approach. And so um, if you want to learn more about PGMIF, I recommend you check it out. Um, there are some downsides to this as a reactor concept. So one obvious one is so you, eject, you inject a target in the center, a plasma target. That's essentially, you can imagine, like a cloud of plasma. Now, a cloud of plasma doesn't necessarily want to stay together. Uh, automatically, it, it wants to fly apart because of those positive and positive and negative and negative um, repulsive forces. So one thing they'll do, one option is you can put a magnetic field on that target. So you can try to put a uh, uh, create a little self structure there that will keep the, t the plasma kind of more or less together longer, so that you can do the compression piece. But in either case, you put in a target at the beginning. It's a cloud of plasma. It kind of gets into the center of the chamber. Then you blast it with these jets from multiple different directions. Uh, when the jets come together, there is a, a primary shock wave, which is where two jets meet and they have a shock wave on the side. And then a secondary shock wave. When those, those first two shock waves collide with one another, they create a secondary shock wave. And then there's a tertiary shock wave beyond that. Um, in the center though, there's a, sort of a line of uniform compression that forms a surface of uniform compression that's created by all these jets kind of merging together. That squeeze is the central target, and uh, the hope is that it gets to temperatures and densities where um, plasma fusion can occur. Now, it, it's, as again, it was sold as a mid-tier uh, temperature and a mid-tier density, so about 50 million degrees Kelvin, halfway between ICF on one side and tokamaks on the other side, and then it gets sort of a mid-tier density in the center, uh, and it sort of avoids the Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities. But there is a, there are problems with that. Uh, for one thing, as soon as the shot is done, you've got a chamber that's full of hazy plasma that's kind of gone everywhere. And to reset the thing for another shot, you've got to pump out the entire chamber again and basically clear away all the, the rubble from the first shot to then fire off the second shot. That's going to take a while. Uh, you know, hours, hours and hours of time is rough, you know, a good rule of thumb for that sort of thing. Uh, at the same time, it's not clear how you would recover energy from this system. Um, you know, an ICF approach like this, you're going to have um, fluid coolant in the walls of some kind or some sort of absorbent, um, like a fly or flibby kind of molten salt deal where the neutrons that are coming off the center is going to go into that and heat that up. And so you'd pump that through a, a primary loop and that would go to a steam generator or heat exchanger, which would go to a secondary loop which would then generate steam, turn, turn turbines, and generate electricity. So a thermal blanket is one way to do it, but it's not clear uh, you know, how much room you have in the thing 
uh, because you got all these plasma cannons that are occupying uh, plenty of room around the walls, and you've got to pump fluid between all the plasma cannons. So uh, that's a basic rundown on what the reactor would look like from a reactor point of view at this time. And if you want more details, again, reach out to Glenn Worden, Scott Sue, uh, and the folks at Hyperjet Technologies uh, to get more uh, updated information on the situation. Now, if you're following along with Private Fusion, you'll know that that whole approach I just outlined is somewhat similar to the way General Fusion uh, does its compression system. General Fusion uh, is sort of similar, right? They inject a compact toroid in the center of their reactor, and then they use compression using liquid metal around the outside to kind of compress around the center. And instead of jets in that scenario, they have these pistons that fire a blocks of material, uh, blocks of material, and create shock waves through the metal, liquid metal. So there are some comparison physics between the two experiments, LPLX and General Fusion's test reactors up in Vancouver, um, but it remains to be seen how viable that is. All right. Well, anyway, thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. And check out the next lecture. Take care.